Hi folks, it's Carlton from the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Uh, we're here today to talk about regenerative agriculture. We're going to go pretty deep this year. Um, I want to start with the basic principles and practices. And I guess before we can even jump into defining or sort of defining, laying out what regenerative agriculture is or is all about, we kind of need to back up for a minute and understand that there's two different models of plant nutrition. So let's just talk about the standard agronomic model of plant nutrition first so that we understand what we're transitioning away from and we can have a better understanding of where we're going to. So the current model, the now outdated model of agronomy is all based on nutrients being transferred through water flow, through mass water flow and ionic exchange based on primarily based on salts, based on, uh, on charge and, uh, and chemical charge. And so the problem with that model is that you're dependent on those feeds to come from chemical synthesized fertilizers because they don't naturally occur in the soil. And then in addition to that, those do damage to the biological communities that would support healthy plant nutrition. So let's just tear that apart a little bit more. Um, for example, mycorrhizal fungi have to be paired with the root of a living plant to survive, to live. And the plant needs those for access to nutrients and water and all that kind of stuff. But we'll just take two pieces of that. Now, John Kempf will talk about this much more in depth later in this video, but water and phosphorus. In conventional agriculture, we go put out seedlings. We want them to have plenty of phosphorus available for good root development. So conventionally, you would put down a chemical phosphorus fur, right? A fairly strong one. And that would give you a great boost in phosphorus availability in that soil temporarily. But long term, you would you would end up breaking the biological connection between the mycorrhizal fungi and the plant. And so now, four weeks later, when that phosphorus you put down runs out or locks up in the soil, that plant has nothing to go to. And guess what? That's at its next phase when it starts building frame, and it needs even more energy. So that's kind of one side of one piece of this. Anyway, so that's one model of plant nutrition, right? That ionic uh, salt solution, water-based if you run out of water, you run out of nutrients, and oftentimes that's when you're later in the season when you're frame building or fruit filling, that drought comes along, you don't have water and you don't have nutrient flow, and those plants take tremendous stress and they don't have any biological community to support them through that stress. That's the old model. The regenerative model works very differently. In the regenerative model, we, use with, we work with plant secondary metabolites, microbial communities, complete metabolites in the soil. So we're talking about pieces that are already assembled. Like we're in the, in the chemical system, you're working with ionic nutrients. They're very small particle sizes. In plants, what we're discovering now is, and actually it's, it just continues to evolve at a phenomenal rate right now. But what they're discovering is that plants, actually plant roots can actually take up bacteria, strip the nutrients from the bacteria and spit the bacteria back out. They can do it with protozoa, they have a connection with mycorrhizal fungi that tie into the ends of the roots. There's endomycorrhizal fungi that actually are part of the root and part of the soil. And it goes on and on and on. This relationship is very symbiotic. And so that's the system that we work with here in regenerative agriculture. And so that said, let's just keep in mind that here in the lab, when I'm working in the lab, we're not working in native soils and we're not working in natural ecosystems. We're not working in sunlight. There is nothing natural in this lab, ultimately. Uh, I'm trying to mimic nature as much as possible using artificial lighting and artificial environmental controls. And by mixing, using right now it's a sphagnum peat moss mix based mix but it has rock dusts and alfalfa meal and mycorrhizal fungi and you know all those components that we talk about that we would amend an outside geologic soil profile with here in the lab we're mixing ourselves so we're trying to like mimic that here i'm not there yet i'm a long ways from there yet as far as i'm concerned and i'm even a long ways from there yet as far as my outside growing goes 
but I'm getting much better at it and understand the principles and practices. And I want to share them here with you today because I think they're very important. And going forward, it is where the future of agriculture is going. And we have some tremendous new tools coming on our side, on small scale and big scale. We should probably jump into that quick before we move on. So let's just talk about some of the upcoming tools in regenerative agriculture. It's currently February 5th, 2024, and uh, I just had Dan Kitchijohn back in January of the Bionutrient Food Association, uh, and Dan is the executive director of the BFA, and for the last 10 or more years, they've been working on something called the Nutrient Density Meter. It is a handheld meter for testing nutrient density in vegetables in the store. That's the long-term goal of it. Right now, they can test 10. It cost about a million dollars a crop to build the database to, to, so you can scale, you know, whether it's good or bad, right? You know, you scan the carrot and find out whether it's up to nutrient density or whether it isn't. But you have to have a database to reference against, otherwise you have no idea what anything you scan means. So to build that database costs about a million dollars a crop. But they've got 10 crops under their belt so far. They've got a nutrient density meter prototype about this big. I've shown that in other uh, stuff. You can check it out on my podcast or on my YouTube channel. Check out the, uh, the uh, Comrades and Farms Season 2, Episode 2, Dan Kittredge. Well, as usual, <laughs> I forgot something. I forgot to talk about plant sap analysis. So let's just touch on that briefly. We'll go a lot deeper into that later on. But plant sap analysis is a better way of testing plant tissue to determine what the nutrient levels are and to balance nutrient levels in the soil and in the plant both, targeting balancing the levels in the plant. Um, so we use plant sap analysis. I've done several videos here on my YouTube channel and on Spotify about that. I've gone into great depth and detail on that and I will go into great, greater depth and detail in the future as we go forward. Um, but I just wanted to touch on that tool is available to us. Up until this year, <clears throat> that tool was only available to us in the form of taking leaf samples off the plants. It's a combination of taking old leaves and new leaves, and you send them into the lab, actually, we send them to Advancing Eco Agriculture, and they send them to Nova Crop in the Netherlands, and they actually extract sap from those samples that we send and they test those sap samples to see what the actual nutrient levels in the sap are. The difference here, I need to really illustrate this point, the difference between tissue culture and plant sap analysis is tremendous. Tissue culture uses something called gas chromatography, where we're drying plant material and then we're reducing it to its constituents, usually through heat or fire, to reduce it down and figure out what the constituents are. Now that works great when you're looking at non-living systems, but plants are living systems, just like humans are living systems. And if you took our blood out and you burned it down and then analyzed it, how much information would that actually give you? Not very much. If you took a live blood culture and analyzed that, you'd get a lot more information. Well, that's the difference between tissue culture and plant sap analysis. And so up until 2024, We've had plant sap analysis in the form that we can send tissue cultures to the lab. That's an incredibly expensive test to do. The last time I did it was in 2019 on my crimson beefsteak tomatoes on the farm. The test itself cost me $65 at the time, and the shipping cost me about $75 because it's two-day overnight FedEx, and it has to be on ice because you got to keep that plant sap in good shape enough that they can test it on the other end to give you results. So up until now, that's what's been. But here's the cool thing. In the last few episodes from Invets and Equal Agriculture, episodes 99, 100, 101, and 102, we've got a whole chain of breakthroughs that have come through. And Advancing Eco Agriculture, as of this year, is bringing forward plant sap testing tools that we'll be able to have on our farm and in our fields. Now, obviously, they're going to be really expensive initially. But over time, those are going to fall, just like all these other technologies do. And eventually, 
I'm hoping eventually this will be something we can actually have even on a small scale in a grow lab like this and actually be able to do it like that. But so those are the tools that are coming forward in regenerative ag. So we have all this plant science is developing regarding how plants interact with soils and bacteria and biology. And then we have the nutrient density meter coming out where we can literally flash a light at something and figure out exactly what its nutrient density is as far as produce goes. And then we have the plant sap testing tools as an array, and we can use those to tune our plants in to grow better, to help build our soils better. And then on top of that, there's a whole bunch of biological science coming out right now. There's a guy named Matt Powers who's doing some really incredible stuff. And honestly, I don't even have time to keep up with what he's doing right now, but he's diving deep into biology. So all of these sciences are coming together in a synchronistic wave, so to speak. And that's really exciting going forward for 2024. So those are just a few of the tools that we know about right now today in February 2024. And it's only going to get better as we go. All right, let's get on with the rest of this series. I'm sorry this is so long-winded, but there's a lot to cover. Cheers. So that's one tool we have. Now, back before I moved to Canada and back to the U.S., uh, we spoke with a man named Brad Lauber of Lauber Seed Farms. Now, he's a, one of the few independent seed breeders here in the United States, and he's been going great guns out there, creating an excellent, high-quality seed supply for us to move forward with regenerative agriculture. Hey, guys, grow the farm up. Have not posted in a minute. We are destroying our last field of mail today. This was a field planted late, uh, about June 10th, I believe. Take a look at that. See those cutter blades down there? custom mounted custom built right there on a little toolbar of our haggy that we made those are homemade you can't like order those from anywhere but they do a nice job of just cutting the mail rows down you can see let's back up and take a look at what he's been doing so this process here the reason that you destroy the mail why destroy the mail well, really, after you've gotten the pollen off of it and you've pollinated the female, get your cover crop going there, uh, really that male plant is almost just kind of like a weed. You want to just take it out because it's just going to use nutrients and uh, water and everything else. You want to pack all of that into those female kernels out there. That's where you want all of the uh, nutrients to go into those female fields and as you can see we've got uh, we did a little bit of rye some irrigated some dry land dry land wasn't so great but the irrigated rye we've got some bins of really nice good high germinated high germinating rye you can just see by this corner here I mean boy there wasn't much the drought's been pretty rough. I know those pro farmer guys have been out scouting all week. I think they sweated all their optimism out by about Wednesday when they realized what's actually going on out here. So it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, I'll be curious what uh, what you guys think. I'll probably put another poll up. Uh, I found those very interesting. And we've been getting 40, 50, 60 replies. It'd be cool if we could get like 100 replies. Uh, it's very, very good information when I'm able to poll uh, the people that watch this channel and uh, watch some of my content, what they think the commodities markets and futures markets uh, look like. And it's good to get to hear from guys from other areas and see what they're dealing with and what their crops look like. So I really uh, do enjoy the, uh, uh, the ag community on YouTube. Um, I've been busy finishing up the tasseling and uh, also uh, cover crop harvest uh, hit at the same time. Still no rain. I mean, we're irrigating everywhere. So thought I'd just post a quick video of the male destroyer and uh, probably put up, uh, keep your eye out for a, a pole from Grow the Farm Up. You have to start with good seed. Seed quality is so much more important and so overlooked. 
We'll get deep into that at some point, and you'll see examples of that here on my channel in this series about cover cropping. And we're going to go into much other stuff. This We're going to start with cover cropping, but we're going to go much deeper into regenerative ag. So I still hope you'll stick around. I know that between the introduction and the other parts of this, there's at least six parts of this series. And as I go through my archives and, and, uh, and I listen to new podcasts and gather more information, I realize that there's so much more I can bring to you and share with you. So if you find this interesting or informative, please like, share, subscribe, comment. Those are the Especially basics. Here. Uh, two different models of mod nutri two different models of plant nutrition. I try to slow down, I'm thinking too fast. And uh, and so the model we work with is with uh, plant metabolites and microbial metabolites in the soil, and not with a chemical single ionic stuff. Uh, which you know, I mean, let's be fair. It's what's fed us for so long, and we've had tremendous productivity with it. But uh, the reality is it's not nutrient density, it's uh, nutrient empty crops. And what we need to do to heal our society and our health and, and many of the problems that become systemic from that in our society, from bad nutrition, bad mental health, bad physical health, and all the cascade that comes from that, we can heal a lot of that by healing our soils and healing our health by using regenerative practices. And so it regenerates our human health, it regenerates the soils, it regenerates our ecology, it sequesters carbon in the soil at a phenomenal rate, it protects the planet and revitalizes the planet. And so it hits all the goals at once while feeding us better food. So that is the essence what regenerative agriculture is and is about. And I suppose I can't ignore the elephant in the room in the context of this, I didn't mention it before. In here we have artificial lighting. We have artificial fans moving air around. We have fans exchanging air through this controlled grow lab system. There's a lot of power involved in this, right? And so this is not a regenerative system. I wholeheartedly recognize and admit that. But it's set up so that we can study regenerative practices in more of a controlled environment and also so that I can survive the winter in upstate New York and not just be in the cold and the snow and, and then sleep in the back of the cold and the snow. I, uh, I really miss my green living plants. This, well, this is what gets me through the winters. So, um, basils and like just go crazy figs. I mean, man, I took these cuttings in early August, I think, of figs. They were just cuts. And now I got full trees. And I got a sneaky oak tree in there, too. But yeah. So, you know, go crazy. So, it's also very nice for that. Anyway, didn't want to, uh, didn't want to not discuss the elephant in the room. Uh, yes, it's true. It I've rambled on a good bit. Uh, I've probably gone back and clipped out a bunch of stuff in editing, but I hope you found that interesting or informative. Now let's get on with it. Uh, I've got a few other interruptions for you talking about regenerative stuff. Don't mind the switch up. This stuff was recorded about a week ago, and I've had to sit back from this whole series and come back and review it again when I wasn't just saturated with it because I just get sick of hearing my own voice. So, all right, let's jump into it. Thanks for watching. Real quick, I've been sitting in here. I turned the fan circulation fan off so uh, you could hear me better on the camera, and I'm just looking back here at the CO2 monitor on the master controller and seeing that this room, room A, was up to 970 parts per million CO2, so me in here breathing really, uh, really uh, So in 2013, up. I set out to do that. I was living on a farm in Tiglin, New York, uh, and it was in a farm that was, had been abandoned for over 20 years, actually more like 40 or 50 years. Prior to that, it was a dairy farm. There were never any pesticides or chemicals sprayed on the part of the property that I farmed. Uh, in part six, we do cover some, some mowing pressures and adjustments for uh, pollinator stuff. Uh, that field was sprayed uh, about 30 years ago with a very heavy dose of atrazine. It's recovered through biology. We'll get into that at some point in this series as well. I have lots of video documenting um, various phases of that, and we'll talk about that. Um, anyway, so... Uh, I, in doing all that testing, I went around with a video camera. I had a digital video camera that I had bought in 
oh boy, 2004 or five, something like that, way back. And so I waited about two years after getting to that farm because I was very discouraged. But after two years and having listened to John Kempf and Dan Kittredge, I was very inspired and I went out and decided that instead of trying to fence it or build farm infrastructure, I'd test out these principles and practices they were talking about and observe some more of the subtle details and see what I could pick up from it. So that's what I did. So the first part of this video is footage that I actually just stumbled across as I was I was surprised. I thought I had lost it in a hard drive crash, but actually I had backup raw copies of it. So I'm pulling some of that video out of archive, and I will be pulling a lot more video out of archive over time here, and revamping it and incorporating it into regenerative ag videos like this. Where we'll get into a lot more detail and we'll go deep in the description, and I'll share my practical experiences with you as well as the, all the theoretical information that I have behind it. We'll pair those together so you can have a better understanding and make a better practical approach to regenerative farming. So, 2013 I started testing. By 2014 I decided that worked really well, and I just kept uh, growing and building. I built that farm out all the way out until 2021. In 2021, I, well, in 2020, I met someone. In 2021, I moved to Canada and married that person. That didn't work out very well at all. So we moved back to the United States, uh, and I had lost my farming operation. And so that's when I started buying grow tents and all that kind of stuff and building the indoor operation until I could find a new piece of land to work on. I did not want to stop my life work of plants and regenerative ag. So that's how we landed here today. That's a little background on the start of this series, so you have some context. And we're going to go ahead and jump into it. And we're going to observe uh, right on land that was not amended in any way what happens uh, based on soil and biology in plants. And you're going to be really surprised at how much an effect plants have. And the whole point of this is really to show you that plants and soils are never able to be separated. You want to build soils, you've got to do it with plants. You can't do it without plants. Plants are the only energy input for the system. All right, I'm gonna drive that home real hard through this series. You get the point. All right, one real brief thing I wanted to cover. Scale doesn't matter, okay? We can do it here in the grow lab. We can do it on the small scale farm that I did. We can do it on the scale that like Brad Lauber's doing out uh, at Lauber Seed Farms in Nebraska. And we can do it on bigger scales than that, like when we spoke with Dylan Vaca of the Long Seed Company. It doesn't matter on scale. It's not important. The point is, the principles and practices apply whether you do it on a tiny little scale or a huge scale. So I just want to make that point. It's completely scalable. Uh, I took that information and I applied it to the farm. I basically went out and I cut rose bushes out and planted in place of them and I planted corn across native blocks of grass. I basically just put down a two by four and took a, a big propane torch and torched a strip and planted directly into that without doing any tilling. The theory was let's take all the no-till and biological and trace mineral and critical points of influence principles and practices and test them in a standing abandoned field where we have a variation of biology, soils, and plants, and see what the results are between them. So as you listen to these different excerpts of John Kempf talking about the various troubles in our agricultural system from this talk in 2013, and things have evolved tremendously in a wonderful way since then. But as you hear him talking about that, keep in mind that this talk and many other parts of it and this is a much longer talk this talk was an hour and a half and this was one of like eight talks that i discovered so understand that this is a very small piece of the information but the point is that i took all those principles and practices and i applied them directly and so the video footage that you're looking at is video footage of 2013 where i went out and planted corn directly into the field sewed it right in in places where it went next to rose bushes, in places where it was out in open native grassland, and so on. Basically to observe, can I grow corn like that? I know corn's a high nutrient demand crop. Let's find out what it can do. Let's find out what we can do working with biology. And you'll notice, I'm just gonna point out before we get on with it here, that 
in the places near the rose bushes, in the places where the bushes and trees and plants were larger and growing with much more photosynthetic capacity and put it out a lot more exudates into the soil system, a lot more sugars and energy, that's where we see the corn really perform. And that's where we saw all the other plants that were grown in all these little test blocks in various uh, spots. That's where you'll see the highest performance. So again, the soil and plant system are paired together. And the soil, the plants provide the energy, and the soil is the digestive tract of the plant. You can never separate those two. I want this point to be really well understood because it's the principal base point for the rest of everything else you do in regenerative agriculture. Everything is based on that principle. Plants and soils work together. Plants provide the energy through photosynthesis to the soil system. That's what does everything else. You can't take the plants out or you have no energy input. Okay, it's super important. And that's why with foliar feeds, we can use plants to greatly enhance soils very rapidly by using foliar feeds to enhance so plant health, we can then enhance soil health very quickly because we can sequester a lot more carbon. We can send up to 80% of the energy in the form of sugars that, is, that a plant captures out into the root system if we can get a plant up to a health point where it has so much excess energy it can afford to do that. That's what we're talking about here. So, I just want you to have some context it's hard to get this whole thing into somebody's head so they really understand it. And I feel like this is a really good foundation for you to have going forward. So, all right. Now, I'm seriously, we're really going to get on with it. Let's roll. We don't actually produce most of them. So of those that we do produce and of the food that we do, do produce, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers. I should have them written down, but I don't. But I want to say that in 2007, the U.S. used like something like 130 million pounds of active ingredients of pesticides in and on our food supply. And yet, hormones, these hormones are effective in these very small concentrations. So, in this presentation, to a certain extent, I use this presentation a lot when I'm talking to farmers in the Midwest, and I recognize that that is not the case here. But I tell farmers that as farmers and food producers, we have a tremendous responsibility. We can do more to keep people healthy than all the doctors and hospitals combined because we can prevent people from becoming ill. We can prevent people from becoming ill by doing two things. First, we can produce high-quality food with a functional immunity that can then transfer that immunity to people. And secondly, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. So let's remove the toxins from our food supply. See that resin at the ends of those trichomes? That stuff is super, super sticky. Like pine sap. But it smells like sunflower. Pretty cool stuff. All my plants this year on the new Hybrex program are producing essential oils. Every one of them. High, high, high amounts of essential oils. Unfortunately, I talk with some farmers in the food production arena, especially in fresh fruits and vegetables, that they grow fruits and vegetables for the market. They're using a lot of insecticides, a lot of fungicides, and then over on the side, away from the fields, they have their own garden, which they use to feed their own family. And I have had farmers tell me that I wouldn't feed what I grow, I wouldn't let my family eat what I grow. So I have one question. If you know and recognize the dangers of what these insecticides do and you wouldn't let your family eat that food that you are growing, yet you will sell it to your friends, to your neighbors, and to your customers, whether they're 10 miles away or 1,000 miles away, are you really loving your neighbor as yourself? If ignorance is bliss, then knowledge is responsibility. Many farmers are not aware and have not been told how these compounds work and what they actually do in plants and to people and to animals and to soils. So now that we have that awareness, now that we have that knowledge, what are we going to do about it? You can see this row of corn fluctuates in direct correlation to the rose bushes 
uh, that are there and the ones that were pulled also. Um, in fact, there were three rows of tomatoes in here also, and only the good ones that came through uh, were only the ones in where the rose bushes were pulled. That's how much biology, biology difference there is just by having rose bushes grow there for 10 years. Makes a tremendous difference in yield capacity, energy field, nutrients, biology, all of it. I just threw in the spot here because uh, I have potatoes in this bin as well. And responsibility also suggests the need for responsibility. So now that we know what the dangers are, and we know we want something to do about, we want to do something about it, what exactly can we do? What are our tools? And how can we go about producing a change in a response in agriculture? So, peppers, black crim tomatoes. Again, you can see the energy field change here. You can see where the rose bushes were ripped out in that bare area right by that starter packet. As you come away from where the rose bush roots were, you see the tremendous diminishment in nutrition in the peppers. These are the same variety peppers. And you literally see a difference in a couple feet, really. I mean, it's good here. A foot and a half over it starts to dwindle, and another foot and a half over it really just drops right out. There you go. There is a rose bush where the corn is, the bare spot. I yanked it out this spring and planted corn and a bunch of other stuff immediately in its place, including cone flower, which I started from seed. And out here where the rose bushes aren't, they're not even beginning to flower yet or stalking up yet. In there where the rose bushes were, not only are they stalked up, but they're flowered out and producing multiple heads. So the question is, how do Roundup Ready crops work? Essentially, um, the, the short answer is that they create an alternate enzyme pathway that is not dependent on the trace mineral manganese. And there's the long answer is 20 minutes long, but that's the These short have answer. A good trace mineral nutrition program going. These are going to be extremely high quality seed for next year. Check out the bones cat, all stretched out, chilling. Doesn't he look like he's in a lap of luxury? Relaxed, happy kitty cat? I think so. I have been richly blessed to have the opportunity to work with some of the leading consultants in agriculture in North America um, and count them as close friends and mentors. I worked with Bruce Tinio before he passed happy. on with Arden Anderson, um, Michael McNeil, Don Huber, Gary Zimmer, Jerry Bernetti. I had the privilege of working with many of these people very closely and learned. So in this next section, um, we've talked enough about the bad news now, and I would really like to talk about what we can do in our farms and our farms to really get this system functioning. And what I'm going to focus on, I know that Dan and Derek are later going to be talking about some of the more specific details in terms of soil analysis, soil mineral amendments, and composting and so forth. I really want to focus on the big system principles of what it takes to really get that system functioning at top, top performance. So the important part, very important foundation is that we need to begin thinking in systems and realize and be aware that everything is connected to everything else. Every single thing that we do on our farm is going to have an impact on everything that is on that farm. For the beginning of this conversation, I'd really like to focus on the soil and plant system. And as I have become more familiar with how the soil plant system works, I think of them so closely together that you literally almost can't separate the two. 
Healthy plants help produce healthy soils. Healthy soils help produce healthy plants. There is such a strong symbiotic relationship back and forth between, the, between these two that both of them have to function really well in order for the system to work as we want it to. So with these two p components, we have this symbiotic relationship working back and forth where the soil is serving as the plant's digestive system and plants in return are feeding that soil biology. So as plants are feeding soil biology, 70% of the total sugars that a plant is producing are exuded out through the root system to feed soil microbes. That's a tremendous number. If you think about what that number means, we recognize that a really healthy plant will have at least as much root biomass below ground as it has plant biomass above ground. So that means if you have a lettuce crop and you have 100 pounds of plant biomass above ground, you will also have 100 pounds of plant biomass below ground, yet that total of 200% represents only 30% of what that plant produced. That means there is an additional 460 pounds out in the soil system that that plant produced and sent sugars out through the root system to feed the soil biology. That is really how you build soil organic matter very quickly. This is, this is the system which was functioning in the Great Plains grasslands, perennial polyculture grasses, tall, uh, tall grass prairies, where built soil organic matter very, very efficiently. Thanks. It wasn't September purely by grazing day with the bison. Planted on 611 or 613, I think. Might have been as late as 626. Um, a full nutrition program start to finish. Uh, foliar feeds at day 10, day 18, day 38 and uh, every seven days in general also. Uh, this is Hope by Blue Flower Corn. was ordered from Sustainable Seed Company. This is now my F1 seed coming off here. And just look at the color. Just look at the color of this corn. It is just a spectacular. Right now I'm a count of rows again. Let's see if we get a mark in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 14 rows with roughly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 400, 30, 40, 40, 40, 50 40. seeds per ear times 200 years. Plenty to plant for next year and have some beautiful corn for this year. Okay. October 3rd, 2013. Uh, harvest target date was uh, 929 for this. This is Hope I Blue Flower Corn. Uh, my F0 Generation 1 Nutrition uh, is the first year out with uh, John Kempf and Dan Kittredge and the Nutrient Dense Supply. Um, been all organic for probably six or eight years now, but uh, John and uh, Dan and those guys really put the rest of those pieces together for me and how, how the trace elements and enzymes and trace element cofactors all work. Uh, in, in conjunction with the biology and uh, so on that note basically uh, this is the first year I farmed anything on this property this has been dormant for 20 or more years uh, it's an old barnyard you can see uh, there were horses in it up till about 10 years ago uh, other than that it's been basically abandoned it was not maintained then at all it was left open dead pasture um, my point ultimately here is that there's a huge difference in the soil uh, in, in the four months that I've been working it already. I'm going to show you this is native ground. Uh, obviously I haven't worked this section of soil and you can see it's very hard and you can see there's a clay immediately I'm hitting clay. I have a hard time scratching or digging in that with my finger. It's very hard and it's very clay like and there's no dark humic matter in it at all. Now so after I learned a little bit about biology from John Kemp, I uh, did a little bit of looking around at some of the different uh, grasses and trees and bushes that were growing here, and I found that around all the rose bushes, uh, there was a whole different soil regime. Um, and just because the rose bushes have been growing here and pumping exudates into the soil and building the soil up, let me show you what I mean. You saw how that other soil was. Let me show you this soil. Look at this. See, it's kind of like 
organic and like broken up and softer. This isn't the best example here. This is further out from the edge of the rose bushes. But you go back in under here, you can see, uh, well you can see that, uh, first of all, everything's darker green here, right in around the bushes. So you can see the biology is active, right? Let me pull some stuff out of the way here so you can see. And like, yeah, look at this. This is an undisturbed spot right here. But look at look at all that dark matter in there, that humic matter. That's just from the rose bushes growing. <clears throat> okay, so what I learned was that uh, there's two tools in two different toolboxes. Uh, one is working with soil and nutrition in soil and biology in soil, and the other is working with foliar feeds. And that plants can build soils even quicker than working with soil directly. And when you work with the two in combination you can just make loops and bounds in no time. So let me show you. You saw right here what that soil looked like. And I've been working, like I said, for uh, about four months, a little less actually, with this spot, about three and a half months. Um, I put down some biology. I put down some basalt microfines, some granite microfines, um, and just some basic trace element support stuff. And I did do foliar feeds uh, at every critical point of influence on the corn. Um, days 10, 18, and 38, I think. Um, and also every seven days, anyway, uh, to continue building my soil, my biology, and to build up the nutrition of my plants because I want to build up the genetic capability of the plants because I'm a breeder. Anyway, um, so this is how much darker that soil is in only three months that I've been working it. This is this was the same soil, and you can see the top inch and a half of this is already loosened up, breaking up, much moister. You can see the granular type of nature around it. Like that's a good sign of good moisture soil that's being worked by earthworms and and biology. That stuff breaks up nice. You can see how dark it is. And uh, I did put down some leaves as a mulch, just some oak leaf mulch that I got from a, uh, a weeding job I did. And let me show you the root system that we developed on these corn. <laughs> also, you'll notice that this is not just one stalk. This corn is thrown up one stalk, and in most cases it's thrown out at least one extra stalk afterward. In some cases it'll throw out two. Um, the popcorn does more than uh, this, but... Yeah, so coming out, these are tillers. Supposedly, if you clip the tillers, you'll increase yields. <clears throat> Not true. <laughs> I would leave your tillers because look at what the nutrition that those are feeding into your plant. That's not even the main root structure. We're, we're talking about like, here you go. Now you're down into the main roots down in there. Take you right in there. Yeah. But look at the root structure coming out of this thing. This is one plant, one corn plant. And you see now why uh, why we have so much ability by working with plants and biology to build soils. Healthy soils and healthy plants really are synonymous with each other. There's no doubt about that in my mind after uh, listening to Mr. Kemp and now having tested all that stuff out. And uh, basically, in four months, I'm able to take soil that wasn't even really growable, put on minimal nutrition and biology and a few foliar feeds, and turn it into high nutrition soil. I cannot wait to see what next year is. Foliar feed on this about two days ago. Uh, the fruit is actually pretty full. Uh, I have pictures which I can share with this. Some of the ones I took down. Here's my cat, Dios, on the cruise. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so I'm just going to let it fill out a little more because it's a seed run and we want maximum completed seeds with the highest nutrition possible and the, all the trace elements and biology to support that is there and we want to fill these fruit out completely thoroughly <coughs> um, so we can increase our genetic potential and uh, hopefully increase our yields year to year.
Uh, I also made a cross with this stuff uh, to a bloody butcher corn, which I'll show you in the next lot in the next video. We make a high yielding um, blue flower corn. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later. Of soil and how you can work with it and foliar feeds and some of the roots that corn produce. So here's a triple. Just to show you the triple stuff. Here's the potatoes. Sweet potatoes and tenebex and some purple potatoes. Purple majesty or you like to peel this aside to like try and dig down in for potatoes and there's just so many vines in here. Like it's ridiculous. And you can see the roots all over those too. They're just everything is just covered in root hairs. Here's a uh, here's a tobacco plant. This is a Montcalm tobacco, and uh, the really funny part is uh, this plant's been foliar fed also, and it's so healthy that a tomato hornworm decided to have a chomp on it, and uh, it killed him. Yep. Sorry, but now you're dead. And I just spotted another one. Ha! <laughs> Yeah, they climb up, they eat some, they die. My plants kill insects. There's no need for pesticides, because my plants kill them. They can't digest their compounds. And here's some mint that's been here for forever. Okay, so this is the bloody butcher corn I was talking about. Like I said, this is crossed with the Hope I Blue uh, with the intent to build a bigger corn ear, higher yielding, higher number of ears per stalk, and uh, bigger ear size, but a blue corn nonetheless. I mean, these are the tillers. These are the tillers. Look at the, look at the root structure on this. This is just insane. Uh, a little too far. You know? Alright, so those just like cut into the sod. The soil is like. While that had an effect, and we had a lot of crop residue being trampled into the soil there as well, we also had a tremendous amount of sugars being sent out as root exudates into the soil system. That is really how you build soil organic matter very efficiently. Basically, I, uh, I wrote an article for Acres about three years ago. I uh, know it's not that long ago. A year ago, whatever it was. That in which I talked about the concept of what I refer to as carbon induction and essentially my comment was that there are really three ways that we can build organic matter on a farm. The first is we can import it onto the farm. We can buy it and bring it in either in the form of compost, in the form of stable humic substances such as leonardite, um, or the second thing that we can do is we can try to produce it on our own farm, either by producing our own compost or growing cover crops, doing what we can to build soil organic matter in that way. However, I believe by far the most effective and the most efficient way of building soil organic matter is with this process of what I refer to as carbon induction. And carbon induction, when you send 70% of a plant's total photosynthates down into the root system, and that, a portion of that is converted into to stable humic substances, you can build soil organic matter very, very efficiently and very quickly. Now there's a key component here, and that is having these root exudates form humic substances instead of being mineralized. And I'll talk about that in just a bit when we'll be talking about soil digestive capacities. So this is really the core. Seventy percent of sugars down into the root system is really the core of the, con the comment that I made earlier that healthy plants produce healthy soils. There are basically two very different models of plant nutrition. The first in real world agriculture is based on the concept that plants can absorb their nutrients as microbial metabolites. And 
I got some resistance on this at one point where an extension agent basically told me, he said, there's no way, there is no documented evidence that plants can absorb microbial metabolites. All the science and all the research is based on the concept that plants absorb simple ions, and there is no way, there is no proof that plants absorb complete compounds or partially built compounds. And my question was very simple. I said, so can you please explain how plants absorb insecticides that are applied to the root system? because those are complete compounds. So plants do have the capacity to absorb complete compounds from the root system, and that is how agriculture really is designed to work. There is now quite an extensive body of research explaining the symbiotic relationships between various groups of uh, fungi, especially the mycorrhizal fungi, the way they colonize living root systems, and how they can extract minerals from the soil mineral matrix and make it available to the plants in the form of microbial metabolites, not in the form of simple ions. The model, which is commonly accepted in agriculture today, is simply that plants absorb their nutrients as simple ions, calcium, potassium, magnesium, nitrate ions, from a water solution in the soil. And that water solution, this, this model of agriculture I refer to as glorified hydroponics. This is the way that a lot of agriculture, a lot of model that a lot of farmers use today. And since it is completely dependent on soil, remember that photo of the corn crop earlier this morning? Since it's dependent on water in the soil solution, as soon as the water disappears, the crop is history. And you send those that some of that fat out into the root system. Let's just say that, uh, just for the sake of discussion, you've sent 100 pounds of exudates down to the root system, of which 4% was fat content. That 4% is going to be concentrated and concentrated down until it reaches 40%. So of that 100 pounds that you've sent down there, you will have built 10 pounds of stable humic substances that will not be degraded any further. If you now have a plant that has an 8% fat content, you will build 20 pounds out of the 100 pounds of root exudates. So the healthier the plant becomes, the more fat it sends to the root system, the more organic matter will be built. So this is really, it's quite exciting that Many people, we've long known, long been aware of the fact that the healthier the soils are, the healthier the plants become. The reverse is also true. The healthier the plants are, the healthier the soils will become. Because the healthier the soil the plants are, the more they will be building soil organic matter and soil fertility. I'd like to touch briefly on this concept of uh, nutritional plant nutritional requirements versus soil nutrient availability and soil nutrient supply. So in these two different models of plant nutrition, the first model being uh, microbial metabolites, the second being that of having sol soluble ions, what happens is that in terms of a plant's total nutritional requirements, when the plant is very small, its nutritional requirements are very important because they have a lot of impact. But in reality, we're talking about very, very small quantities. A corn plant six inches tall doesn't have very large nutritional requirements. But as that plant begins building plant frame and as it begins finishing fruit, its nutrient requirements escalate dramatically. And on many soils that are being farmed using the conventional model of having simple ions in the soil solution, the nutrient availability in the soil begins to decline at exactly the same period as the plant's nutrient requirements begin to increase. This will be of, on many crops. This is the period of late June, early July, when plants begin building plant frame and filling fruit. Their nutrient requirements go up, and it's many times at that time of the year when we get low moisture, low rainfall, soil begins to dry out, and the soluble nutrients that we are dependent on that are in the soil solution, all of a sudden the water has disappeared, and the plants can't get the nutrients that they need. So when that happens, the plant's nutritional requirements are at their highest, the soil's nutritional availability is at the lowest, and this leads 
directly back to the comment that I made earlier this morning that 90% of a plants of most 90% of disease and insect pests are a result of cal calcium and potassium shortages at these stages. It is not that the soil doesn't contain the nutrients. Most of the time, uh, almost invariably, the soil will have more than adequate calcium and potassium and other minerals to supply the plant's requirements, except they are not in an available form because the water has disappeared. The flip side of that is, if you go to the model where you have microbes serving the soil, serving as the plant's digestive system, and extracting nutrients and making them available to the plant, it will exactly, first of all, it has, it, that system can function with only a fraction of the water required by the other model. Soil can still be quite, soil can be quite dry, and the microbial population will still function, it will still be digesting soil nutrients and root exudates. And in this process, it will still continue to release nutrients and make nutrients available to the plant. So even when the soils become dry, that system, that model, can still provide adequate amounts of plant available nutrients. And the beauty is that the system was designed to work. It was designed to function, has functioned this way for thousands of years, and plants are designed to be able to get all of their nutrients from the soil as its digestive system. If we feed forages to a dairy cow, how much energy does she get from those forages? Zero. The cow doesn't get any energy from hay. The cow doesn't get any energy from grain. The cow is really getting her energy from the byproducts of microbial digestion in her rumen. So what happens is in the rumen, in this fermentation vat, you have bacteria, you have yeasts, and you have other microorganisms digesting the carbohydrates, digesting the fats, digesting the proteins that were present in these feedstocks, and breaking them down into the soluble components, which are your monosaccharides, your simple sugars, the amino acids, and very importantly, also the essential fatty acids. These soluble compounds can now be transferred across the gut lining and across the cell membrane and used by the cow as her energy and nutrition source. Exactly, exactly, identically the same system needs to function in soils. It's really how it's supposed to work. So this again is an illustration of how the nutrient exchange system really is designed to work, where you have soils feeding plants, you have plants feeding soils, you have the symbiotic relationship working back and forth. Take either part of the system out or weaken either one of those two parts and you will weaken the entire system. So I'd like to talk briefly about the different plant reproductive cycles and the various plant hormones. I find it very interesting that many of the plant critical points of influence are based directly and are directly linked to the various stages of reproduction. And essentially, we have two, we have a couple of different reproductive cycles based on different types of plant growth. Um, as I described earlier, we have the four main stages, the four kind of overarching stages that apply pretty much across the board to all different types of crops. You have planting, framing, filling fruit, and finishing fruit. For the moment, I'd like to really focus on the annual crops. So on the annual crops, at planting, our primary considerations at this stage are we want to have very strong, vigorous growth, strong establishment. We want to build really strong root strength. And on the grain crops, all of the grain crops, the uh, cereal grains and corn, for example, are determining a great level of their embryo development at this stage. As I talked about the corn developing the number of ears that it could potentially have at the 9 to 12 day stage, much the same holds true for a lot of the cereal grains. We hit it. But so here we go take a look at what happens this corn had that accelerate I'll have to take a look in the chart but it was fairly early on uh, in the stage of growth and so for example you can see I'll step back here you can see the row right next to the carrots is tremendously darker it's taller its tassels are more filled out its leaves are bigger its leaves are darker and it doesn't show deficiencies like some of this other corn does. And then 
If we look even closer here, for example, we'll take a look at this corn plant. This corn plant has one, two, three, four, five, six ears of corn on it. Yeah, six ears. This is the same variety. This is incredible. What is very interesting here is that we need to be very careful at this system that we don't Earlier, um, the question was asked is what can we do at this system to enhance the overall system's performance? And as I described, we need to really focus on both the soil biology and mineral nutrition. What often happens at this stage at, in conventional systems is that they will use soluble fertilizer type compounds that help that plant get established very strongly, very well, but in the process they sabotage the soil microbiology and effectively shut it down for the rest of the growing season. So as an example of this, think of mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi colonize living plant root systems and they extract water from the soil when the soil is very, very dry and make it available to the plants, giving plants a very strong degree of drought tolerance. And they also extract phosphorus from the soil mineral matrix and make it available to plants. So we know that in order for plants to establish a very strong, healthy root system, we need to have good levels of phosphorus availability to build a strong root system. So conventional practices are that at planting or at transplanting of fruits and vegetables to apply a strong dose of a water-soluble phosphorus source. In corn planting it might be 10-34-0 orthophosphate. For fruit and vegetable production it might be a 12-48-8 or whatever it might be. It's a, they're typically the very water-soluble phosphates. So what happens when we apply that fertilizer as a nutrient drench when we're planting or transplanting, we provide that plant with a strong available source of phosphorus and it can establish a really strong root system. The challenge is because of the high levels of available phosphorus, we've shut down the soil mycorrhizae. They will not colonize a root system that has such high levels of phosphorus. So fast forward four weeks, four weeks later we have the plant has now utilized all of the phosphorus that was provided early on and what it hasn't already utilized is being complexed in the soil system and so now the plant really urgently needs a stable supply of phosphorus. However, you've shut down the mycorrhizal fungi, they haven't colonized the root system and now you have sabotaged that root system for the rest of the growing season. That's very critical at this stage of growth that we do everything that we can to provide very good mineral nutrition and also enhance soil biology. We have to have both of those systems in place. The second stage uh, at building frame, we really need to do everything that we can provide, especially provide calcium to build very sturdy frame to carry the future fruit load and make sure that we have good stem strength. This goes back to the comment that many of us don't know what healthy plants actually really look like. If we want to produce 80,000 pounds of tomatoes per acre, the tomato stem coming out of the ground has to be an inch and a half in diameter. And I've seen that on a lot of farms. That is a really healthy tomato plant. Uh, at maturity, when you have ripe fruit, should be inch and a half in diameter. The if we talk about, um, I'd like to focus on that for just a moment on the tomato stem size. We found that many of us. On our farm, we were producing tomato transplants in the greenhouse, and this is actually a very critical part of r uh, eliminating stress at the planting and transplanting period, is actually a very critical part of building plant frame later on in the growing season. So we found that if we stressed our tomato plants in the greenhouse for any reason whatsoever, um, tried hardening them off, for example, or anything like that, these tomato plants will develop a reddish zone on the stem and then when those plants are transplanted into the field later on in life that reddish zone will never 
expand as well as it could. So what you will see on a lot of tomato plants, when you go out into the field, look at tomato plants later on in the growing season, once they have established their plant frame and they're beginning to fill fruit and finish fruit and they're approaching maturity, is when you look at the stem coming right out of the ground, you will see a several inch section that is very tightened, very hardened, and very woody. And that is that section of stem that was stressed when that tomato transplant was still in the greenhouse. When you go up above that section, all of a sudden the stem will expand and it'll be a lot bigger. It won't be nearly as hard and woody and it'll look a lot healthier. That is because that, that hardened zone, that, that stem is essentially your nutrient transport pipeline in which you're sending, the plant is sending sugars down to the root system, it's extracting minerals and taking them back up into the upper part of the plant and if you limit that by stressing that transplant, you will never achieve the total plant health that could be possible and you'll never get to 80,000 pounds of tomatoes per acre. It's not going to happen. At this stage, it's very important that we have adequate calcium to build all the cell membranes. I know I must have mentioned this at least a half a dozen times already. But what is quite interesting is that inside the plant, calcium does not move around inside the plant. Since calcium is used to build the cell membranes, it is not mobile. Once it has been taken into the plant and used to build the plant cells, it stays stuck right wherever it is. So what this means in practical terms is that we need to have a continuous available supply of calcium throughout the entire growing season. Commonly a lot of crops will have adequate levels of calcium to supply their needs early on. When the plant is six inches tall, it doesn't need a lot of calcium. When the plant is two feet tall, it needs a lot of calcium. And if the calcium isn't there to meet its nutritional requirements, the newer leaves, the newer cells that that plant is developing will have inadequate levels of calcium, even though the older leaves at the bottom of the part of the plant might have plenty of calcium. So that is actually a lot of... Uh, if you have a calcium shortage, if you have a calcium deficiency, it will always show up on the new growth first for that reason. The third stage of filling fruit, sizing fruit, as I described earlier, is all about transporting sugars into the fruit for top quality and making sure that we have adequate potassium inside the plant to transport those sugars into the fruit. Potassium is almost exactly the reverse, exactly the opposite of calcium in many different ways in that potassium, whereas calcium is not mobile inside the plant because it's used to build the cell membranes, potassium is just the opposite. 97% of the potassium inside a plant is actually in the, in the plant sap. So it can move around inside the plant wherever the plant needs it. For that reason, when plants run delinquent on potassium, they can't get enough to meet their requirements, they will pull potassium out of the lower older leaves and push it up into the top part of the plant. So potassium deficiencies will always occur on the older leaves first. Calcium deficiencies will always occur on the newer leaves first. And remember, as I commented earlier, 90% of all disease and insect pest problems are directly connected to a deficiency of those one of those two minerals or those two in combination. In fact, um, I am not talking today about plant sap pH and the various methods of uh, monitoring crop health, but we had, uh, there was a time period when we used plant sap pH to monitor plant health based on the research work that was pioneered by Bruce Tinio, in which he discovered that healthy plants will have a plant sap pH of 6.4. As that pH increases above 6.4, you have an increase, you have a deficiency of the anions, such as uh, phosphorus and sulfur, especially, and you have an increased susceptibility to insect attack. As the pH decreases below 6.4, you have a deficiency of the cations, primarily calcium and potassium, can also be magnesium, and you have an increased susceptibility to disease attack. So you have insects on one end of the scale, diseases on the other end of the scale. And we use this very successfully in the field. It's a very accurate diagnostic tool if used properly. The problem was simply that 
then we discontinued using it to a large extent simply because 95% of the samples that we pulled were continually acidic pH. They didn't have enough calcium and potassium. So we learned very quickly that the first things that we need to do are address calcium and potassium in plant, in plant nutrition and plant health will increase very significantly. The fourth stage on these crops is when they begin finishing fruit. And I described earlier the finishing fruit is that we need to have very good fruit maturity. And we need to, it's this time frame, we especially need good trace mineral nutrition so that we have very good seed quality. I know that Dan will probably be talking later about the importance of seed quality. If we really want to build really strong, healthy, high quality seeds and increase our genetic potential from crop to crop, this is the section that we need to focus on. We need to have good trace mineral nutrition so that we have healthy, high quality seeds. This is also how we achieve high levels of density and test weight. Uh, an example of this, when we first, when we were still using a lot of chemicals on our farm, we had a kind of a small sideline crop that we produced a fair amount of green beans. And the green beans, our buyers wanted green beans packaged in half bushel containers um, with 10 pounds per half bushel. We shook and packed and jammed to get 10 pounds of green beans into a half bushel box. Today, green beans are now one of the main crops on our farm, and 